Well, another good day for Sunday school. Glad to have everybody here. And like I've said before, I'm glad all of our members are here and uh, we welcome visitors for whatever reason you're here. And we'll probably be here until this epidemic is over. Today's lesson is titled, Our Mysterious But Approachable God. The purpose of it is to forgive ourselves for failing to live up to the covenants God offers us while seeking to become more obedient. In other words, I don't have any problem um, knowing that God will forgive me of my sins if I ask him. That's not my problem. My problem is being able to forgive myself. And sometimes it takes a lifetime to learn how to do it. So we'll read the scripture and go on from there. Our scripture today comes from the book of Exodus, uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Those are the books of the Torah. Each one of them has a purpose. Uh, the Exodus starts with the children of Israel coming up out of Egypt, out of their bondage. So here we are in the 24th chapter, the first 12 verses. Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to the Lord, you and Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, sorry about that, and 70 of the elders of Israel. You are to worship at a distance, but Moses alone is to approach the Lord. The others must not come near, and the people may not come up with him. When Moses went and told the people all the Lord's words and the laws, they responded with one voice, everything the Lord has said we will do. Moses then wrote down everything the Lord had said. He got up early the next morning, built an altar at the foot of the mountain, and set up 12 stone pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. Then he sent young Israelite men, and they offered burnt offerings, sacrificed young bulls as fellowship offerings to the Lord. Moses took half of the blood and put it in bowls, and the other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. And they responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and the 70 elders of Israel went up and saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like a pavement made of lapis uh, lazuli, as bright as blue as the sky. But God did not raise his hand against these elders of the Israelites. They saw God and they ate and drank. And the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain and stay here, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and commandments I have written for their instruction. That's the scripture and the key verse from it is uh, the seventh and eighth. Then he took the book of the covenant and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said, we will obey. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. And everybody that believes that the children of Israel uh, did better than we did, and when they said, we will obey, they meant it. And they may have, but they didn't obey at all. That's where we pick up with their lesson. The laws that they were given tells the people how they should treat their slaves and how slaves were to be obedient to their masters. The law tells us how, when, and why they should worship, sacrifices, and celebrations. They were told not to suppress an immigrant but to remember how they once were immigrants in a foreign land. Subjects such as lawsuits, bribes, and animals were covered, along with how to build the tabernacle and altars. God talked a lot in the book of Exodus. Sometimes he was talking to Moses, sometimes to the people, as the law covered every phase of Hebrew life. I've copied the law, including the Ten Commandments, the Shema, in the laws of Moses. It came out to be 75 pages long. 
Now, I'm not going to go over all of them to you. I just wanted to show you how many laws there were that the Jews had to live with. And I will read a little bit of them. Here are the Ten Commandments in full. Our version is cut down a little bit. It says the same thing. But here are the Ten Commandments as found in Exodus 22 through 17. And I'm quoting from the, the New King James Version. I am the Lord you, your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. The second commandment, you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing mercy to the thousands, to those who love me and keep my commandments. Third, you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Fourth, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you nor your sons nor your daughter, nor your male servant nor your female servant, nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the seventh day and hallowed it. Those are the first four uh, of the Ten Commandments. And if you'll notice, all of those first four refer to God. Now the last six refer to our brothers and sisters. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. In the 10th commandment, you shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife, nor his male servant, nor his female servant, nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that is in your neighbor's. That's the Ten Commandments as we find in the, in the book of Exodus. The Shema is one that uh, Jesus used to uh, tell the people what the most important commandment was. And it started early and is still be used, being used today. This is the Shema. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up, tie them as a symbol on your hands, bind them on your foreheads, write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. Uh, I wouldn't dream of trying to read all of the ten, all of the 316 laws, but I did put 10 of them down just so you would kind of get an idea of what some of them are. Uh, of the 10, the first is that I'm quoting says to cleave to those who know God, two, to love other Jews, three, to love converts, four, to hate to not to hate fellow Jews, five, to reprove a sinner, six, not to embarrass others, seven, not to oppress the weak, eight, not to speak uh, derogatorily of others, and nine, not to take revenge and 10, not to bear grudge. That's an example of what some of these 316 laws are. Like I said, it'd be boring reading to read you all of the full of the 613 laws, but the ones I just read, here are 10 that I just picked out in a row of laws that uh, Israel lived by before Christ, and the Jews are still living by today. Last week, uh, we used the story of John Wesley's struggle over his faith. While he rode out a storm, 
on board a ship. He just couldn't trust God and shake off his fear. Part of Wesley's struggles were over feeling forgiven. I've had Christian friends that tell me that if I didn't have a soul-shaking experience where I wanted to laugh and cry at the same time, I just hadn't truly met Jesus. Wesley must have felt this way because after years of doubt, he had a memorable meeting finally at Aldersgate and finally felt that his sins were forgiven. Martin Luther had the same doubts as Wesley and had trouble experiencing God's mercy and forgiveness. These spiritual giants struggled with the same doubts as we do. But as for myself, I was raised in the church. I used to always laugh and say that I was born in the back pew. Uh, I knew from the get-go that I was a sinner, and my experience with Christ came slowly over the years, from the time I was a small child till I became an adult. We need to face our sins honestly, but also need to remember God's forgiveness and accept it as we confess our sins, because he is a God of grace, love, and mercy. The stated purpose of today's list that I read in the beginning was to forgive our sins for failing to live up to the covenants God offered us. Jeremiah 31, 34 hit me squarely when he quoted, quoted God saying, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. There's no doubt in my uh, mind about God forgiving me, as I said. I know he already has, but I ask him if I'm serious about it. My problem is forgiving myself. No, I'm working on it. If I can just quit remembering my past sins. It seems as every day I think of something I did when I was a kid or a young man or even now that I've got to be an old man. I read a story one time about a man who woke up in the middle of the night. It was pitch black. He couldn't see a thing. And he was kind of afraid. He threw his legs over the edge of the bed and stood up and slowly walked forward holding his hand out until he ran into a wall. When he reached the wall, he started feeling around. He came to a corner. He turned the corner and felt along the wall again till he came to another corner and kept going till he ran into the third corner and then the fourth corner and finally a fifth corner and realized that he had gone completely around the room and there were no doors and no windows and it was so dark he couldn't see his hand before him. In a panic, he shouted out, Someone help me! A gentle sounding voice said, How can I help you? In a shaky voice, the man said, who, who are you? The voice said, I'm God. The man spoke again. How do I know you're God? What's the worst sin I ever committed? It was silent for a moment. And then the voice said, I don't know. I forgave you and I don't remember. And that's what God promised us. Covenant relationships come in an assortment of names. They come in uh, things like a promise, an oath, an agreement, understandings, pledges, and a dozen or more others. Those are covenants, an agreement with, between two people. The one we're most often familiar with is our wedding vow, where we answer the question, do you take this man and to the wife, or the man, and uh, man saying, do you take this woman? However, it becomes legally necessary for unmarried couples who have not made a pledge or a covenant to be legally covered. This is a legal thing that the states have taken on. So they say by living together for a certain period of time, they established a common law marriage. In the beginning, there's no reason for the first man and woman to have any rules. There were only two of them. And all they had to do was to live in peace with one another. Only thing was they were not to eat the fruit of a certain tree, but that didn't work out, did it? Covenants then had to be made. By the time the Israelites left Egypt, it was obvious that rules were needed. So God gave them the law to live by. He took Moses up on Mount Sinai and they hashed it out and God gave them the law. 
Some of the people disobeyed and saved food until the next day. This was when the manna came down and God told them that when the manna fell, they were to gather enough of that food uh, for one day. The only difference being that on the day before the Sabbath, they were to gather enough food for two days so they wouldn't have to work and cook or do anything to the food on the Sabbath. Uh, some of the people disobeyed and they saved food until the next day and it rotted and smelled. And some went out seeking food on the seventh day when God told them there wasn't going to be any on the Sabbath. The people did not live ethically as one body like they had promised to do. Well, today, social scientists have predicted that people do not live up to their own expectations about their morality. One research project concluded that when they evaluated their own behavior, they thought it more epic, ethical than it actually was. In looking at our own lives, we see problems we have in obeying God. We genuinely do not know the right thing to do and feel that we're better than actually we are. We can easily find excuses for our own sins and to point out the sins of others to hide our own or make us feel that we're not quite as bad as the others are. We act out of what we think we need and we'll use any excuse to get it, whether it's moral or not. A big part of the Old Testament laws make no sense to us or even fit in our lives. Other of the Old Testament laws, like God and our loving God and our neighbor, fit us today as well as they did the day that they were given. Ethical behavior recognizes the power and love of God, and that recognition gives us the wherewithal to choose what's right and wrong. We won't always get things right, but if we try, if we, we have a loving God that gives us second chances, even if we don't forgive ourselves. Meals at the church have been a focal point in the life of the church from its very beginning. In Exodus 12, the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, these are the regulations of the Passover meal. So you might say the Passover meal was the first family dinner. In the law, there are directions for meals for the celebration of many events. Continuing into the New Testament, we can pick out several. The most memorable of all was the Last Supper. The core fellowship, well, another one I, I didn't think was uh, two was uh, feeding the 5,000. The core fellowship in many of today's churches is the fellowship dinner. And no wedding would be complete without a wedding meal. No matter what God's participation is in the meal, fellowship with God is the summit of the life of faith. Every meal in the church, and which should be in every Christian home, is a prayer of thanksgiving, including God's forgiveness of our sins. In like kind, since we know God has forgiven us, is to forgive ourselves and continue on in the lives God has given us. The purpose statement for today's lesson is to forgive ourselves for failing to live up to the covenants God offers us while seeking to become more obedient. As Christians, we believe in God the Father. We believe in his Son, Jesus Christ. We believe in all that God has told us. We also know that we're sinners. And if we pray and ask God for forgiveness, he'll give it to us. But we have to make sure that we forgive ourselves or we can't go on. We need to seek to become more obedient. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank you for being such a good Father, for treating us so fairly, for being so kind to us, especially for forgiving our sins. We know, Father, that we are sinful. We know that in asking, you will forgive our sins. Help us then to realize that we need to forgive ourselves before we can go on and forgive others and live the lives that you would have us live. In Christ's name, amen.